Honorable Member for Library. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise to add my voice to this very important debate. If one listened very carefully to the Prime Minister, he made this boring seem like a walk in the park. And listening to him, if I did not know better, Mr. Speaker, I would have been inspired. I have great difficulty, Mr. Speaker, in actually getting my consent to support this borrower. <coughs> and everything is sensitive to context, Mr. Speaker. Everything is sensitive to context. Had we gone with the arrangement with the World Bank, this year, the airport redevelopment would have been completed. And it is sad that the Prime Minister allow, allowed three years to just go by. And now he comes to the House and talk about the problems being experienced at Iwanora International Airport. But as I said, Mr. Speaker, everything is sensitive to context. And since coming into office, Mr. Speaker, whatever the pretense is to the contrary, this government has not been borrowing to explore practical realization in critical projects that would uplift the various constituencies in St. Lucia. They have not been borrowing to invest in the productive sectors of the economy. They have not been borrowing to encourage prudent fiscal management of the country. They have not been borrowing to provide resources to at least help the pro productive enterprises in this country. They have not been borrowing for us to try to match the skills with the requirements of the economy or to borrow to invest in early childhood development programs. They have never built on the platform laid by the former SLP administration to create a sustainable, growing, job-creating economy. They have not been borrowing, Mr. Speaker, to expand the public works programs to include both labor-intensive construction and social services to address the causes and consequences of poverty. They have not been borrowing to reducing disparities in access to education. They took away the laptop programs, and we'll see in a while what they have been doing for the past three years. They have not been borrowing to finance the development of support programs to farmers to ensure the appropriate use of land and appropriate land use data collection systems for planning and monitoring purposes. They have not been borrowing, Mr. Speaker, to accelerate the implementation of social programs that will help prevent crime from taking place. They have not been borrowing to enhance the capacity of the intelligence structures and the Royal St. Lucia Police Force. They have not been borrowing to improve access to health care for St. Lucians. For the past three years, Mr. Speaker, up to last night, I was in the immediate vicinity of the St. Jude's Hospital. And it was sad that after three years, instead of going and complete the hospital, they have decided to engage in foolishness and have not gone to the original site and complete the buildings. Mr. Speaker, the government has been borrowing to invest in projects that are not even of marginal relevance to the development of St. Lucia. Outside of the normal borrowing to finance our recurrent expenditure, debt, etc., the normal things that we do, they have come here to borrow for the PAC company $42 million, abandonment of a meat processing facility $25 million, acquisition of land for meat processing facility another $12 million, building of an unnecessary road for T.O. King's DSH $13 million. 13, I was told. 12. Is it 13, Mr. Prime Minister, not 13? 13. Awarding of Permandu, a contract for vision planning 
of over $30 million when during the campaign period preceding the arrival, they were criticizing us for having a, a, a vision committee. They said they had the plan, but yet still, Permandu is being given $30 million to just see me when Puin Eclisi. Acquisition of debt laden Caribbean jewels property, over $100 million. And Mr. Prime Minister, through you, Mr. Speaker, if all the things that I have said are incorrect, then the Prime Minister is free to intervene. While they have been borrowing, they have not been borrowing to implement our national priorities. That is what they have been doing. On things that are of no developmental value to the people of this country or for the future of this country. And now, this HIA redevelopment must be viewed in that wider context, Mr. Speaker. In that wider context. What is even more disturbing to me is that over the period of the three years, we have been cautioning the government, go ahead with the PPP arrangement with the World Bank and stop wasting time and resources. I told them that that $150 million that they borrowed recently would be insufficient. I have told them that they shifted the building away from the original site to closer to the river. And obviously, it's going to have cost implications, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, but my compelling arguments for going ahead with the World Bank were as follows. And I said that in the last budget debate. And just to remind this Honorable House, and I quote, $170 million is a major investment to expand and upgrade Iwanara International Airport which the country could avoid at this time, given its high debt to GDP ratio. Matching the provision of airport capacity with the demand, while achieving and maintaining airport profitability and an adequate level of customer satisfaction is a difficult task. It is made particularly difficult because investments to expand airport capacity are lumpy, increasing effective capacity by much more than is needed in the short term, and because they must be planned long in advance. Uncertainty is inherent in developing and operating complex infrastructure and services, projects like airports, and it is for this very reason that government officials seek public-private partnership to mitigate complex risk. Hence, the arrangement we had with the World Bank was soundly based and for fiscal risk to be effectively mitigated and privatization of airports could bring some much needed additional private money for investment." Unquote. I informed this honorable house that this is standard practice in airport finance. For example, I invoked the authority of Norman Ashford and Clifford A. Moore in the publication Airport Finance on page 65. It states, and I quote, the pressure to move airports out of the public sector is widespread throughout the world. And the international financial markets will become even more important in the development of airport financing." Unquote. That same source continued on page 66, and I quote, In terms of lending volume, the World Bank Group is the largest agency in the world providing financial and technical assistance to developing countries in all loan and credit transactions. Major emphasis is placed on project appraisal. The procedures used are designed to ensure a satisfactory rate of return on investment and a high priority of the project in a general development sense." Unquote. The publication, air transport infrastructure, the roles of the public and private sectors, infrastructure economics and finance network, the World Bank, it states, and I quote, private operations of airports has disclosed substantial efficiency gains. For example, better and longer use of existing assets. Often, however, the sector has performance and fiscal risk that need to be carefully managed by governments, unquote. The conclusion of those studies are fully supported by research undertaken by other experts 
in the field of air transport economics and finance. And therefore, at this juncture, Mr. Speaker, I wish to invoke the authority of Professor Doganis in, his, in this publication, Airport Development, on page 50 to 51, on the economic characteristics of airports. And I quote, major development programs push up unit cost. A major new terminal has to be cooled, heated, lighted, cleaned, and maintained, and even with the number of passengers using it, well below the design capacity. As a result, unit costs per passenger rise, often dramatically, and airports having undertaken major expansion schemes often find themselves losing money. Conversely, smaller airports that hold back on investment, even though that they are heavily congested at peak periods, may actually achieve profitability despite the smaller traffic throughput and higher unit cost. The implications are clear. Airports should hold back investment as long as possible if they want to keep the unit cost of production low. In addition, they should avoid grandiose developments which entail very large jumps." Unquote. And I remember saying to this Honorable House, Mr. Speaker, I am not suggesting that we hold back on the airport development, but we allow the World Bank to undertake the development whilst we free our hands to take care of the pressing but legitimate needs of the people of this country. Mr. Speaker, the dual, the dual airport operation in St. Lucia was a natural choice to allow the World Bank to undertake that development. Because regional traffic and international traffic are split between the two airports. And as long as you have that scenario, what meaningful hub operation you are going to have? And a casual glance at the experience of other countries will reveal that. In Germany, in the heart of the city, you had an airport that could have taken care of traffic. The infrastructure was perfect. But because it was reaching its capacity, another airport was built outside of the city center. And despite the fact that the majority of people lived in the city center, they closed down the city center airport and consolidated traffic in that one airport. And today it's a major hub. Hong Kong had a city center airport. They flattened some islands to build a modern airport. And they actually link that airport via bridges to the land. And today it's a major magnet in that particular area. But in Malaysia, they built an airport outside of the city center and kept the city center airport open. So passengers from the city center used to take a flight to Singapore and go to London, go to North America, go to other parts of the world. And it was simply not working out as a hub. After a while, they closed down the city center airport and started to realize the advantages of being a hub. So when the prime minister says that he wants to build a hub, he cannot have his cake and eat it. And again, airports do not have control over what routes airlines fly. The airlines are the ones who determine that based on route analysis and the global competition for air services. Not airports. Airports provide a place to facilitate business. But airports are not in direct control. What you can do is to mitigate some fallout by what you do at home. But certainly, in terms of the monies in a lockbox lock, lock mechanism to finance this and to finance that, we have no direct control over those things, Mr. Speaker. So the arrangement with the World Bank had the potential to be fully financially self-sustaining. And the government's role could have just been focused primarily on safety and security regulation. Mr. Speaker, I told this Honorable House that given the change of the, the location of the terminal building, it would have caused implications as they are moving a major investment to a vulnerable area. Even where the existing terminal building is, Mr. Speaker, during heavy rains, you get flooding at the airport. Are we going to come here and borrow another set of, of millions, Mr. Speaker, 
to go and deal with the river? Already, the river was diverted, of course, to accommodate the airport where it is. What plans do you have to deal with that river if you are going to take a major terminal building and put it closer to the river? And today, Mr. Speaker, this government is back here. On top of the 150 million US dollars they came here to, to guarantee. We are back here with a guarantee to borrow for, for a, a, a motion to borrow five two hundred and two million dollars, five hundred thousand. It begs the question is this additional borrowing? Or is it because Taiwan has not released the funds for the terminal? because you have not satisfied all the requirements. You see, you see, Mr. Speaker, countries or financial institutions do not just give you money to build things just like that, especially a terminal. You, as a St. Lucian, would go and build a house. Planning would require a plan and if you are going to get financing from the banks, the banks would generate a bill of quantities on that plan to come up with an approximate cost of the building. And sometimes you still go into cost overrun. But an airport is much more complex than building a house. And what is it that they come with? Under the former Labour Party administration, a master plan was done to inform the planning and execution of works. That is important. And Mr. Speaker, ICAO, which is the International Civil Aviation Organization, and exporting an aerodrome design manual document 9157, and the master planning manual document 9184 clearly established the guides for the planning, the guidelines for the planning and development of an airport. Airport planning is a systematic process used to establish guidelines for the efficient development of airports. A key objective of airport planning is to assure the effective use of airport resources in order to satisfy aviation demand in a financially feasible fashion. Mr. Speaker, an airport master plan is invaluable in this regard as the primary objectives of the airport master plan are to develop an attainable phase development plan concept that will satisfy the needs of the airport in a safe, efficient, economical, and environmentally sound fashion. In this regard, Mr. Speaker, an airport master plan presents the airport blueprint for long-term development. A few of the goals of a master plan provide a graphic representation of existing airport features, future airport development, and anticipated land use. To establish a realistic schedule for implementation of the proposed development, to identify a realistic financial plan to support the development, to validate the plan technically and procedurally through investigation of concepts and alternatives on technical, economic, and environmental grounds, to prepare and pre present a plan to the public that adequately addresses all relevant issues and satisfies local, state, and federal regulations where those things are applicable, and to establish a framework for a continuous planning process. Whilst the former SLP administration, to inform the scope of works, did a master plan by altering the existing location of the terminal. Were those things done, Mr. Speaker? Did we undertake master planning? Did we look at the environmental impact assessment? Did we do all of those things to inform? And if all of those things are in place, then I believe by now, funds would have been available from the $150 million that we borrowed some time ago to start the project. So Mr. Speaker, is this government respectful 
of the recommendations of the many technical reports that have been conducted on the Hiwanora International Airport. For example, the land use plan for Hiwanora International Airport, which was prepared by Acres International Limited for Transport Canada under the Canadian International Development Agency in 1987. The report found that certain existing facilities, both on and off airport property, violate ICAO's Annex 14 zoning criteria for strip width and transitional surfaces. The report stated that zoning violations could only be solved by the acquisition of additional lands along the southern airport perimeter, both within the town and from NDC. The report also made the following recommendations to protect lands along the disused runway. All of those questions must be asked in relation to the proposed development that this government wants to undertake in a vitify -vi fashion. There is no clear thinking, no clear plan. So already, we are in a land use problem. And they want to land us in a financial disaster, Mr. Speaker. So no action was initiated based on the report that was presented. And now, they are actually encroaching, instead of protecting the lands around the airport, they have built road for Tioaking, a road that's highly unnecessary, a very costly undertaking, whilst my people in Labry, Alan Weezy Street, must endure that deplorable condition. The main road in Labry, the Carter Road. And only recently, Mr. Speaker, and I made this point in this honorable house that I was going to intervene on the Carter Road, and I did. I had to bring relief to the people because that road was impassable. There's a lady called Miss Ellis, right up. An ambulance could not go there to access the lady's house. She cannot walk. And now, any toy car, any racing car can go there because I have intervened on that road to bring relief. I could have gone to every barn all over the place just backed up the government. I will not do that. I will not lie down on the ground and rule. I will do things that I can, and I expect the government to join me in bringing relief to the people of my constituency. And so while they have $13 million to go and build road for Tiwa King and his horses, you know, they do not have money to invest in the real productive things in the, in, in the country. And they come here to borrow for airport development. Huh? You came here 150 million US dollars from the Taiwanese. You come here 200 and 2.5 million. Next time, how much are you going to ask for? 500 million? Half a billion dollars next time? And it goes on and on, instead of allowing the World Bank to undertake the development. Today, we would not have that debate in this house. Had the government come in, allow the World Bank to undertake the development, we would not be coming here to talk about that. We would be coming here to discuss investment in the real productive sectors of the economy. The laptop programs for the, for, for, for the children. How are we going to expand employment in this country? Can you imagine, Mr. Speaker, that after three years, nothing has been done, and they only beat in the chest, but elections are coming. You know, when you talk about employment creation, with the Royal Town and Harbour Club, the Labour Party allowed hundreds of jobs to be created. And we have been in a very fortunate situation that a number of people who are looking for jobs in St. Lucia have found jobs outside of the country. Because the hurricanes destroyed Dominica, St. Martin, you have a number of our skilled people out there. And yet still, you cannot boast of a significant reduction, realistically, in unemployment. So, Mr. Speaker, we have been cautioning this government about its reckless and unnecessary borrowing. But when elections are fast approaching and there's nothing to show, like I said, for the millions it has borrowed, it will do anything and everything to expedite the commencement of the Hiwanora International Airport. I'm hearing so many things, Mr. Speaker. 
I'm hearing that they are going to expand the existing terminal building in, in, in a northern direction, taking that main road in front of the terminal building. So I think since I'm on my feet in this house and we are discussing this particular issue, that I can ask the Prime Minister whether those works are actually going to be undertaken at Iwanara. To, to deal with the existing terminal building instead of allowing the normal gestation period for things to be done properly. You see, Mr. Speaker, you see this conversation in this country where, oh, they should have done it already during their, their, their term in office. Yeah, you all didn't do it. So we are going to show you all how we can do it. There is a gestation period for everything. In fact, in effort planning, it would say it takes between five and ten years to plan and implement a project. So you must have all the technical details done pa, before you could do it. But we hear, oh, you all should have done it. You all should have completed the building. It's like you get married. And after two months, your wife is pregnant. Where the baby? <laughs> Where is the baby? The baby is supposed to come in two months. We need to step away from that attitude and allow the proper gestation period to prevail. In two months, you'll not get a, a baby that's healthy. You'll not get any baby. So wait for nine months. And sometimes the child may be born prematurely at seven months. You want a full-term baby. And we took our time to develop what we were going to do at Iwanora. And then, and then we're going to implement. But, but no, the microwave, the microwave government, they can make everything happen. But they are now realizing that things don't happen quite the way that they believe it's going to happen. You think that you just roll on a government and say, I need money now to invest in this. And I've said before, any financial facility, agency, institution, that would give money for any development that will not insist on proper procedure. We are, we are going to look at this thing very seriously when we return to, to office very shortly. Very shortly. Because you see elections coming, they're getting all hot and sweaty. You know, they run there, they're on television there, they, 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 they're trying to create things. But the people of this country know better. They know that this effort could have been completed this year. They know that by now St. Jude's would have been completed. But the gallery for, for freers, you see me, couillon, pour toi l'année, et qu'après une élection vini, you have tout by fait. So, Mr. Speaker, we have told this government that at the rate it is borrowing, we might be confronted with a scenario where a sharp reduction in spending would have serious repercussions for our country. Because of the need to cut spending in the future. You know high deficits are not sustainable forever, Mr. Speaker. And reducing a budget deficit can be problematic. If a country has a deficit that increases too quickly, the government may be forced to adopt policies aimed at a sharp reduction. And these austerity measures can cause a fall in aggregate demand. When you jump the brakes too abruptly on spending, you might create a recession in the country and do not recover from the situation. Mr. Speaker, we have gone down that road before. In the period 2006 to 2011, we had a very high fiscal deficit inching toward 10% in the economy. When we came in in 2011, we had that same situation where we were warning the government during 2006-2011 of those high debt to GDP ratio and high fiscal deficits, but they were not listening. They were busy spending for elections, so there were fiscal slippages in the economy. Consequently, when we came into office in 2011, government investment was necessarily constrained by the tight fiscal policy in pursuit of macroeconomic stability, Mr. Speaker. Hence, we had to stabilize the economy before we could have engaged in serious borrowing. Consequently, in 2013, we had fiscal space to maneuver and borrowed US $20 million for St. Jude's Hospital. And they came in and abruptly 
stop it. Mr. Speaker, go and do the Cartier Road and, and, and Major Mel. Go and do Cartier and Major Mel. Mr. Speaker, we are very concerned with the heavy borrowing from our local banks. In this case, Bank of St. Lucia. I heard the Prime Minister saying, you know, the banks are in the business of making money. You know? The Prime Minister is boasting on one end that things, uh, things are happening in the economy. We are, you, you swear that this economy is growing like a, a, a homesick angel, you know, climbing because they want to get to heaven. Behaving like that. But you see, Mr. Speaker, if that is the case, you allow the private sector to invest more. You don't compete with the private sector for investment. And at a certain point, they will want to sell bonds. And they say, oh, you know, it is good. The people will get returns on bonds. But if somebody has uh, $1,000 to invest in bonds, they do not have that $1,000 to invest in something else. So it does not matter how you look at the scenario, there'll be the crowding out effect. And $202.5 million is a significant amount. And so when the Prime Minister make it sound as if, you know, things are so nice, you know, and then the banks should be happy that government is coming to borrow, that's not how things work. So, Mr. Speaker, as I prepare to close, I must ask myself, where are we with that loan from Taiwan? Where are we with the loan from Taiwan? That we cannot wait, we have to go to Bank of St. Lucia. And I'm hoping that Bank of St. Lucia does not engage in some activity that will compromise them in the sense that if all of those requirements are not yet in place for the Taiwanese to release the funds, then Bank of St. Lucia should not release those monies. Unless there's a master plan, unless everything is in place. Because you see, when you're building a house, you're building any structure, they want plan. Health needs to, 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 to approve. Everything must be in order. And airport redevelopment is not a joke. It's a very costly undertaking. And I'm very concerned that this is not the last time we have seen this government come in here to ask us to, to allow SLASPA to borrow so we can guarantee it's going to impact the debt to GDP ratio of the country. And when that happens, it will prevent us from actually borrowing to invest in the real emergencies. You know, we have a visitor every year in our region, hurricanes. And they talk about climate change in a very casual fashion. <coughs> but it's real, Mr. Speaker. And we have more active hurricane seasons. And the people remain at the stadium. This government is very, very callous and insensitive where those matters are concerned. They don't listen. You want to come in, you have your own agenda for development. Allow the PPP to continue. You remodel the economy. And you build on what you find. But no, you want to destroy everything and come with some brand new idea that's like Espoir Malpapai projects. Look, 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 look at the annexation of the Boseju lands to do things for Tiwa King. Huh? Papi show that's going on there. Nonsense. And you expect to come on the south and the south and the south and the south? What is the total cost of the airport, Mr. Speaker? We must ask. Because we come in there, you know, in a piecemeal basis we are borrowing. Where are we going with, with, with this airport? How will that impact BOSL? I'm hoping that Prime Minister could illuminate those issues. Hopefully it would lead to a deeper understanding of the spectrum of issues that I have raised. I have a, a, a spectrum of concerns. And I know when the member for Kashmir South East comes to, to add his voice to this debate, he will provide some of those responses. He will. But all they had to do was to allow the World Bank to undertake the development because all the planning requirements were in place. 
and the government has chosen to go down a very problematic route, and we are going to have problems. Even if they started the airport in June, you would not have airport by the time election comes. You would not have airport. You would not, you'd, you'll be there next time by not building St. Jude's, by closing down Radio St. Lucia, huh? Huh? fish marketing cooperation, everything. You believe that you're okay? My time is up, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, I cannot support this type of reckless borrowing. I cannot support borrowing for something that we did not have to come to this house to borrow. Education, health care, fine. To assist farmers legitimately, yes. Our emphasis is on a little contract there, a little contract there. We cannot grow an economy on that basis, Mr. Speaker. And this is where I'm going to close. If we do not invest in the productive capacity of the, of, of the economy, we are going to have even more problems. Because contracts will come to an end after we do things. But we're not building capacity for our young professionals who go out and study to find jobs here. And they will migrate. And the economy is going to shrink. And we are going to have problems in this country, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, I am hoping that this government would revisit, even at this stage, revisit its approach to the Hiwanora Airport redevelopment and do what is right. It is not too late for them to go back to the World Bank and say, I'm sorry, I believe we made a mistake. We are back, and we are back on track. And come and do this thing for us, please. I thank you, Mr. Speaker.